Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. I'd like to have you take your Bible and we'll begin with by turning to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and let me read this portion to you as we once again think about this idea and the subject of tongues. We are in the subject for a few weeks because we are chapters 12, 13, and 14 deal with it quite a bit and so the Lord obviously has a lot to say about this subject and so we need to spend some time with it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaks in a tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, to exhortation and comfort. He that speaks in a tongue edifies himself, and he that prophesies prophesieth edifies the church. I would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesy, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? For even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself to the battle? So likewise, ye except ye utter by the tongues, tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, once again, we thank you for the time that we have to gather together to study your word and to understand it. Father, we pray that you would Put it within us a heart that wants to be clear, to be able to share the gospel in such a way that people would understand it. Our world today does not seem to have any desire for the gospel. They have no need for the gospel. But Father, help us to be able to show them just the great blessing of having a God in heaven who loved us enough to die on the cross for us, that we can walk with you and know you. And Father, I pray that that would be something that would be evident by the hope that's within us. Once again, we're grateful for the blessing of the day and just pray that you'd help us to understand this passage. In your name we pray, amen. To begin with, I want you to take your Bible. I know this is not in my notes and it's not on the board, but I want you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I want you to look at verses 5 and 6 to begin with. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. This, uh, this passage in Ecclesiastes, I've thought of many times. Very interesting passage. You understand that lo love is part of the character of God. It's enduring, it lasts forever, it will never end. It's been an eternity past, it e will be an eternity future. Love is the surrounding force. God is love, therefore that is, again, what colors everything we say and do should be in love. We speak the truth in love, we we walk in love. Everything about us is, is designed to be in love. But the gifts that God has given to the Holy Spirit to us, through the Holy Spirit to us, are for a purpose. And all, those, all of those gifts are purpose-driven gifts. Now I want you to understand that the fact that they are a purpose and a purpose-driven gift indicates that they are temporal that they are just temporary. All of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are temporary. Now I know that's debated and that will be debated, but, I, but I've shared with you last week in eternity, are we really going to be needing mercy in eternity? One of the most clear uses of the gift, of course, is the gift of evangelism. There will be no use for the gift of evangelism in eternity. There's no one to lead to Christ in eternity. They're either in heaven or hell so you won't be using that gift in eternity. 
One of the reasons that this is true is Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. And we read, Whoso keepeth the commandments shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. Because every single thing that happens in this world revolves around time and judgment. And so there is going to be an accountability for everything we've done. There's going to be a time when, when we have to do it and a time when we're going to be judged for it. Now I want you to consider for just a moment, I know this is really abstract thinking, but it's something that we really need to think about, that there will be a time when time will no longer exist. That's a strange statement. There comes a point in time when God will stop time and time will no longer exist. The very first thing in the Bible is time. The very first thing is in the beginning. That is the creation of time. There was in eternity past no such thing as time. And we read in the book of Revelation that there will be time no longer. It actually makes it very clear that there will no longer be any time. Therefore, when you read or when you sing the song, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, that's not true. There is no time in eternity future. There are no years, no, there are no months, no days, no, no minutes, no hours. And because the passage says to every purpose there is time, to every purpose there is judgment, if there is no time, and I know this is strange thinking, the purpose that we have in this earth, all of our purposes will end. You cannot have purpose without time. Now again, we're going to debate that. We're going to think that one through. And I may be wrong on it, but that's what the passage is saying. To every purpose, there's time and judgment. When you have a purpose, there's got to be some time involved with that purpose. And so when you get into eternity and time ceases to exist, what purpose do we have? Well, the purpose, of course, will always be the glory of God because that's part of his character. It will be the love of God because that's part of his character. It will be truth because that's part of his character. Everything that has to do with God is what eternity is about. But every single thing that deals with the church, with our purpose in this church, is a temporary prob process and a temporary situation or a temporary problem. There's nothing that we have in this church. By the way, it includes marriage. Because marriage ceases to exist in eternity. There's no marriage in heaven. There is no purpose when you have eternity. At least not the purposes that we have today. So when it comes to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, every single gift has an ending. And so some of the things I'm just sharing with you, of course, is apostleship. Apostleship had an ending. There, were, there are 12 apostles of the Lamb. God set up apostles. There were apostles, Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, Philip, Thomas. There were, there were lots of apostles. There were 12 of them. But the gift of apostleship was given to the church in, in its infancy when there were no scriptures given yet, when there were no pastors, no deacons, no Sunday school teachers. There was no New Testament and so the apostles had this ability to receive revelation from God and instruct an early infant church. And they used that ability of apostleship to instruct the early church. Prophets. We start with first foretelling, and of course foretelling, there are many prophets in the Old Testament, many prophets in the Old Testament that foretold of future events. You have Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, many prophets in the Old Testament. But when it comes to the New Testament, we only have one prophetic book. The prophetic book of the New Testament is the book of Revelation. And of course, it is a book about prophecy. And it talks about coming events. But there were prophets in that time that told about coming near events, short-term events, and it said there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the earth, which came to pass. That's a prophecy. And he gave that prophecy. It was by revelation of God to him to guide the church, and there were many prophets during that time. Now, it's not just foretelling, though it is also foretelling in the New Testament 
And obviously we have it in 1 Corinthians 14, 5. It would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. And we're not necessarily talking about future events here. We're talking about God's revelation given to man in a foretelling of prophecy that God gave to the church by way of revelation. And I'm saying that that also ended with the, the book of, of Revelation. We no longer have a need for having foretelling of God's revelation. We have the gift of preaching which takes God's revelation and gives it to people. But prophecy is God directly revealing his truth to us. My first point in my outline again today is it's all about edification. The first point is it's all about edification. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 5, It would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Prophecy is greater than tongues. No, unless there's an interpreter. If there's an interpreter, then they're equal. Then the church is receiving edification. If there is no interpreter, then the prophecy is not edifying the church. I mean, sorry, the tongues is not edifying the church, therefore prophecy is preferred. I want to start with this. In the New Testament time, as you all know, they elevated rich men. Rich men were blessed of God. If you were rich, you were under God's pleasure. God was blessing you, was giving to you. If you were poor, you were under God's displeasure. God was not blessing you. And most people during the time of the New Testament strongly believed that. If you were rich, you were blessed of God. If you were poor, you were cursed of God. And that went a long way with the gifts as well. There were some gifts that were more spectacular than others. And if you had these spectacular sign gifts in the church of Corinth, you were obviously closer to God and more blessed of God if God gave you divine revelation directly to you. And they raised up those people. Now, the greatest gifts were not necessarily the revelatory gifts. But they were elevated by the people and the people would take those revelatory gifts and desire them so that they felt that they were closer to God. I want you to understand that the gifts are not designed to build my kingdom. They're designed to build God's kingdom. They're not designed for me to use the gifts to be able to edify and build up myself. Now, there's going to be debate on that too at that point, but I want you to understand that there are people who have used the abilities that God has given them to promote their kingdom. They really do strongly believe it. It says the blessing affects every part of life you have been promised, eternal life, healing, deliverance, and prosperity. And of course, Kenneth Copeland expresses gratitude to the purchase of the, of the, 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 the G5 jet that he, they, they, that I think that's their fourth jet or third jet that they bought in the Kenneth Copeland ministry. Now, obviously, maybe, maybe I would like to get a private jet. I don't know if you want to help me with that. I have about 25 cents. That's seed money. If we can get them a couple more dollars, that'll help. But he just says here, the physical, it controls the physical. The spiritual life is not separate. It controls the physical. In other words, if you are close to the Lord, it will lead to physical blessings. This house here, of course, is Joel Osteen's place, but he says, I declare a legacy of faith over my life. I declare that I will store up blessings for future generations. My life is marked by excellence and integrity because I'm making right choices and taking steps of faith. Others will want to follow me. God's abundance is surrounding my life. God's abundance is surrounding my life and they strongly believe that God's wealth, material wealth, is a sign that God is blessing them. And if they have more money, the more money they have, of course, the greater their ministry, the greater their blessings. And that's just some of the ways that people think today. Having said that, then, you can understand in the New Testament how you would feel closer to God if you had a gift that was revelatory over something that was just plain helps or ministry. I can picture, now I've never, I've never spoken in tongues. You say, well, you have never sought for it, Pastor. Well, the early church in Acts 2 was not seeking for it either. And they spoke in tongues. They never sought for it. 
But in Acts chapter 2, they all spoke in tongues and people heard them. But I could imagine if a person did speak in tongues and they went into their bedroom and they started to speak in tongues and they could feel God's presence in their life, they would feel very close to God because God was speaking directly to them. They didn't understand what he was saying, but he was speaking directly to them and proving to them that he had put his hand upon them of his pleasure. And he had handpicked them of all the people to be for his pleasure. And, and by the way, that's true of all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's true of every gift. But I don't think that that's what 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about. It's very evident that tongues does edify myself. But the writer here, Paul, is not saying that that's a good thing. I think he's saying that that's not the way the gifts are supposed to be used. The gifts are not designed to be used for self. That if I have the gift of preaching and I learn that if I use that gift of preaching, I can buy myself a Gulf Stream jet if I'm good at it. Or if I have a special gift and I know how to use it, that I can use it to advance my own agenda, I don't think that's what the Bible's talking about. It's not for personal gain. It's not for personal edification. It's for the body of Christ. Obviously, we read that tongues is used for personal edification. I'm not de debating that. If you, in chapter 14, once again, we read these words. He, for he that speaks in a tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. It says in verse 4, but he that speaks in a tongue edifies himself. He that prophesies edifies the church. So yeah, there's a difference. The one who speaks in tongues is edifying himself. You say, wait a second. Look at the context. It's all about love. We read in verse 4 of chapter 13, charity suffers long, it is kind. Charity envies not, is not bonded, it's not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not its own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, rejoices in iniquity, rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I want you to notice again, it's not about being puffed up. It is not about seeking its own love in the context of what our passage is talking about makes it clear that the gifts are not about seeking my own. It's not about seeking for myself. Once again, I would talk about this. It's, it, uh, it's, it, once again, it's... Uh, Charity is not puff up. It does not seek its own. It's not, it does not envy. It seeks the good of others. It is about the truth. Tongues is not about me seeking my own good. Tongues is not provoked. It does not think evil. Does not, tongue does not elevate itself in pride. It's all about edification. Prophecy is about the edification of the church. And again, we already mentioned that. The gifts are given for a purpose, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, plural, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And this chapter, chapter 14, is making it very clear to us that he wants us to edify the church and not, not just edify ourselves. It's greater if you prophesy than he that speaks in tongues unless you interpret that the church may receive edifying. It's about the edification of the church in building up the church, not building up me personally. 1 Corinthians 14, 32 says, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. And I want you to understand that when it comes to all of the gifts, God has given us these gifts that we are commanded to control. They don't control us, we control them. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now you can imagine, I don't know that this happens often, but I do think it happens. Balaam in the Old Testament had an ability to bless and curse. And Balak knew that. Balak came to Balaam and he says, I know that the one you bless is blessed and the one you curse is cursed. I want you to come and curse Israel for me. 
Now please understand that Balaam had the ability to control that gift. He had the ability to bless those that God blessed and he had the ability to curse those that God cursed. We find that Balaam used that gift for the wrong reason, he used it for the wrong purpose, and through that was able to curse Israel. And God cursed Balaam through that. But the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, and it is probably true that we can use the gifts in an improper manner. That's the key here, isn't it? That people can use the gifts of tongues in a way that's not designed to edify the church, but edifies myself. And Paul is saying that's not the purpose. That's not the purpose that God has given to the church. The gifts are all given to edify the body of Christ, not to edify individuals. We're using it wrong. It's the wrong purpose. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Prophecy needs to have a distinction of the sounds. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you if I speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or a doctrine? I was waiting on the side of the road for the tow truck to come. It was hard to get the tow truck there. Peggy said, they're not going to come in this kind of weather. It's too hot. <laughs> well, they finally came. But it was getting really, really hot. By the time they came, I had the wheel off. I had the starter out. I had the <laughs> crank sensor out. And it would have been fixed in about five minutes. But anyway... But we were sitting there working it, and the tow truck driver came, and I said, this is stupid. Why am I fixing this thing? The tow truck driver's coming. Why am I fixing this? Okay, forget that. I'm not going to fix it. Wait until the tow truck driver comes. He comes there, and, and I say to him, okay, now I'm not going with you. I just want you to bring the truck to 925 First Street Northwest in Byron. He said, yep, I'll get it to Byron. I'll get it to Brian. He said, I'll get it to Brian. I said, Byron. <laughs> he said, yeah, I got it. He didn't write it down. I'm thinking, ah. Oh. I have no clue if this guy's going to get it to my house or not. I have no clue if he knows where this, this is. He didn't write it down. A distinction in the sounds. You have to know my address. There are lots of addresses out there. And I'm thinking with Peggy, we're, we're, we're coming home afterward. It could be anywhere in Byron. It could be in Brian for all I know, if there is a Brian. But the first thing he said, I'll get it to Brian. No, Byron. <laughs> oh, yeah, Byron. Anyway, anyway. Having said that, it's critical that there's a distinction in your sounds. You have to know what's being said. You know, over the years, religion has used religion for its own profit hundreds of times, thousands of times, tens of thousands of times. You, you know, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome was built by the money of poor people. It was built by indulgences. Tetzel would say the moment you would hear the sound of the coin falling into the cup, the soul of your loved one will leap out of hell. The moment God would hear the sound of your coin falling into the cup. And poor, poor people raised $5.4 billion in our, would be equivalent to how much money we would raise today. $5.4 billion during that time with 46 million ducats that they, that they raised to build that. 120 years they, they built that, that cathedral. And they built it by saying that if you give money, your loved one will no longer be in hell. Can you really say that? Is it proper to say that your loved one won't be in hell if you give money? But again, it's, it's been kind of the way things are. Over the years, people want to build up mighty churches and build up their kingdom by use of gifts or use of, of let's say they have an ability to motivate people. If they could motivate people to change, if they could motivate people to get money, just think of the power they could have if they had the ability to motivate people with their words. And hundreds of people have done it. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself to the battle? Now, I don't, I don't have this on here. I'm not able to do that because I didn't, Logan wasn't here to be able to get this going. But, but all of the, the ones that I have here are trumpet sounds in the military. And I wish I could show them, share, share them to you. Um, I wish you could hear them because all of you in the military know those trumpet sounds. You know those bugle sounds. 
and they all have a distinction in their, in their sound. Originally, there were probably three or four notes, and you can imagine if the trumpet would sound something like, you know, something like that, or maybe something like that. The problem is your trumpet player, your bugle, bugler, he has to have a distinction in his notes. And if he does have a distinction in his notes, whatever, whatever the sound is that he's making, the people who would hear that trumpet sound, ah, it's time for food. Ah, it's time to wake up. Oh, it's time for reveille. Oh, it's time to whatever. And they have, each one of them have different sounds in the military. And I didn't write down what those sounds were because I was hoping if I could have played them, the people in the military would have recognized them right away. You would have known exactly what it was. But he says this, there are in the, it may, it may be so many kind of voices in the world and none of them was without signification. The word ma, for instance, ma, M-A, ma. That word means my in French, it means but in Italian, it means mother in Hindi. But I, I get a kick out of this because there are four ways of saying ma in Chinese. Now we have a Chinese church here. And so I, I was reading Chinese, trying to understand a little bit of it. I don't know it, but it's like ma, ma, ma. And there's like four different ways of saying it by inflection. And you could either say mother or horse or hemp or scold. But that word ma could mean horse or it could mean mother. It could mean hemp or it could mean scold. So if you say ma, you might be calling your mother a horse. You've got to be very careful on when you say ma or ma. The, you, know, you could have heard the distinction in the sound. Chinese people, right? They, they know the difference in ma or ma, and they know the difference. Wait, wait, by the way, which one is mother? Is it ma? Ma? Okay, what, what is horse? Okay. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> you all could hear the distinction in that, that, and you could tell the difference between a horse or a mother, but, but on, obviously, there are every sound. If you, if you started going, that has a distinction and probably a meaning in every language. There's probably one of those sounds might have a meaning somewhere. I might have said ma in there somewhere. Every sound has some meaning someplace. But you understand if you're in your room and you're saying, you're saying these words, if God is speaking to you, but you do not understand what God is saying, there is absolutely no purpose because what's really happening is God is speaking to God in his language and God already knows what he's saying. So God does not need to talk to God. If God is going to talk to us, he needs to talk in such a way that we understand what he's saying. And it's what God did when he gave us the Bible. It's what he did in the Old Testament. It's what he did in the New Testament. When he gave us the New Testament, he gave it to us in Greek, which was a universal language of that day that everybody understood Greek and everybody spoke Greek. And so it was a common language. And by the way, he waited until that language was common throughout the world to give the Word of God so that it could be given to every single person on that earth. Now, there were people in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 that did not speak Hebrew. They were from many other countries, and they came together, and they heard the disciples speak in their own language wherein they were born. It was the distinct sound and they heard them and understood that it was the wonderful works of God. Not only did they understand thoughts and, 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 and noises, but they understood what the meaning was. That is the wonderful works of God. You are proclaiming, I believe it was the gospel. 
Because according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you're looking with me at verse 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not, prophesying serves not to them that believe not, but for them which believe. There is a purpose for tongues, and the purpose for tongues is not for the, the believers. The purpose of tongues was for the unbelievers because they spoke a different language. They didn't speak the same language of the church. And so people come in that don't understand your language. What good is it going to give them if they don't know what you just said? Every sound has a meaning, but God is saying to you, he that speaks in a tongue edifies himself. I would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesy. Greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except you interpret. Notice that the commonality edifies the church, that the church may receive edifying. Edifies the church. The other is not edified. Let all things be done to edifying. Are you getting the point? He says it over and over and over and over again. The point of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is what is the purpose of the gifts? It's to edify the body of Christ. It's not for personal accomplishment, for personal gain, for getting more money to motivate people so that I will build my kingdom. It's not about seeking self. It's not about what makes me feel good. And unfortunately, what has happened in tongues, in the tongues movement today, it's become a personal prayer language and edification, and it edifies self. It edifies self. It does not contribute to the body of Christ. And that's why he says in this chapter, pray that you may receive the ability to interpret or keep silent in the church. And again, I'm not making that up. This is what it says. Verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. And again, what am I saying? Because the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets he can still pray, he can still, but in the church, keep silent. Because that's not the purpose of tongues. The t purpose of tongues is to edify the church. Now, now listen, I, I'm talking to Calvary Baptist Church. Obviously, this is a Baptist church. We believe in the Word of God. We believe in the, the purpose of the God's Word. But there are lots and lots and lots of churches out there that speak in tongues, that believe in tongues. I'm just saying what you need to do is look at the Word of God and see what it's saying. Is it saying what you think it's saying? It is not talking about personal self-edification. The whole point of this is to edify the church, the body of Christ. My gift of preaching is not to edify me. Your gift of encouragement is not to encourage yourself. Your gift of helps is not to help yourself. Your gift of of uh, mercy is not to be merciful to yourself. Not one of the gifts is designed to be used individually. Every single gift is designed to be used to edify the body of Christ. And that's why we need the gift of interpretation if we're having tongues. In Acts chapter 2, they weren't seeking it. It came because there was a purpose, there was a need. There were multitudes of people there that needed tongues, they needed the language of the gospel. 3,000 people came to know Christ the Savior that day. It was not for personal edification. Tongues is for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. It was a purpose for unbelievers. Prophesying is different. Prophesying is for the church, for, to edify the church. And so everything needs to be done decently in order. We need to be looking at this chapter and saying, what does it say? It's about edifying the body of Christ. Once again, we th want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, 
that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.